All right, so I love the Elder Scrolls. I've been a fan since playing Morrowind when it first came out. I was totally drawn in by all the different quests I could go on, all the different skills I could use, and the nearly infinite possibilities of what kind of character I could play. I was blown away, and I couldn't wait for the sequels. Both Oblivion and Skyrim would also succeed in sucking me into the world of Tamriel. I played the absolute hell out of these games, totaling easily over a thousand hours of game time between the three of them. None of them are perfect, but they're all fantastic games. If you want to know which one I prefer, it's Morrowind. And while I could go on for hours about why that is, that's not what these videos are going to be about. No, what I'm going to be sharing with you is the lore of the Elder Scrolls, which is extensive to say the least. There's thousands of years of history and mythology that takes place before any of the games. If you were to look at a timeline, you'd need a magnifying glass to see the periods of time you actually experience in-game. All of this stuff is available to you in-game via character conversations and the numerous books you can find and read. As I found with most RPGs, some of the best stories you can find in the Elder Scrolls are contained in those books. It's my goal to share the best of those stories with you. As with all things, we need to start at the very beginning, with the creation of the gods, the universe, and the world as we know it. This period is known as the Dawn Era. Now, we're dealing with prehistory here, so we need to rely mainly on religious texts and myths, which aren't that reliable and vary depending on which culture you're talking to. Everyone has a slightly different opinion regarding who created who, whether or not some gods are actually gods, and the motivations behind the actions of certain gods. This whole rundown was cobbled together from a wide variety of often conflicting in-game sources. Due to this, the following synopsis will not be entirely accurate unless I go over every interpretation that exists across every culture, which would take weeks. The sequence of events detailed in this video is the way that I understand it best. If there's anything that I'm blatantly wrong about, feel free to leave a comment and include a source. Also, a lot of the things I'm about to bring up are going to have to be glossed over for the sake of time and simplicity. These may end up being the subjects of future videos in order to give them justice. Anyway, let's get started. So in the beginning, there existed only chaotic nothingness. From this nothingness arose two beings, Anu, also known as Anu the Everything, who personifies order, stasis, and light, and Padome, also known as this word, which is purposefully unpronounceable, who personifies chaos and change. These two are counterparts, equal and opposite. Being opposites, they fought each other. And being equals, neither of them won. After this clash, Anu decided to create itself a soul in order to reflect and better understand itself. Padome did the same. The soul of Anu became known as Anui El, the representation of everlasting light and soul of all things. The soul of Padome would be known as Sithis, representation of nothingness and the void. Just like Anu and Padome, Anui El and Sithis are equal and opposite forces to each other. One thing of note at this point is that none of these four exist in the same way as the gods that come to follow. They're just shapeless, abstract beings, which is why some cultures don't consider them gods at all, but simply cosmic forces of nature. And even though Sithis is often shown as a skeletal being and is sometimes called the Dread Father, these initial two and the two they created lack gender and any tangible form whatsoever. Anyway, just like their predecessors, Anui El and Sithis had some disagreements. Instead of fighting, however, they laid out a set of conditions, which would result in the creation of the Arbus, which is a fancy word for universe. Afterwards, Anui El created itself a soul, just like Anu did, in order to self-reflect. Anui El's soul was called Oriel, later known as Akatosh, who would become chief god of the divines. Before Oriel's creation, the Arbus was turbulent and unstable. Oriel stabilized it by creating the concept of time. With the Arbus stabilized, other lesser gods were free to come into existence. These new gods include the beings who would become the Aedra and the Deidra, and are collectively called the et Ada, or Original Spirits. Along with these new gods, new planes of existence came into being for the gods to inhabit, Aetherius and Oblivion. And here is where the drama begins. 
Sithis, like Padme before him, was a copycat and decided to create itself a soul as well, called Lorcan. It is believed by some that Sithis created Lorcan with the intention of undoing the work of Auriel and returning the universe to a state of chaos. Thus began Lorcan's plan. You see, the gods weren't all happy with the planes of existence they had to choose from as their eternal home. Lorcan approached them with the idea of creating a new plane for themselves. He proposed creating the mortal plane, Mundus, and populating it with beings of their own creation. Many of the original spirits, including Auriel, were convinced that this was a great idea. However, there was one little problem. Although Anu and Padome were infinite and could create without consequence, Auriel and the rest of the Et'ata were not. In order to forge their creations, the gods were giving up pieces of themselves, making them less powerful. Allegedly, Lorcan knew about this from the start. Many of the gods realized what was happening and opted to leave Mundus before it was complete while they still had the chance. Chief among these was Magnus, the architect of Mundus, whose departure tore a hole to Aetherius, creating the sun and allowing Magicka to flow into Mundus from Aetherius. The rest of the gods who departed made smaller holes, resulting in the stars. The last of the remaining gods in Mundus were understandably pretty upset that they had lost much of their divine power. Oriel created the Adamantine Tower on Nern, which would remain standing on the Isle of Balfira in Iliac Bay for all of history thus far. The remaining gods gathered there to decide Lorcan's punishment in the monumental event with the boring name, the Convention. It was decided that Lorcan's heart would be removed and destroyed. Upon removing it, however, it was discovered that Lorcan's heart couldn't be destroyed. Now, this next part makes no sense, so you'll have to bear with me. The prevailing theory for why Lorcan's heart couldn't be destroyed was because Lorcan's body became the planet of Nern. Therefore, Lorcan's heart is also the heart of Nern, so destroying the heart would mean destroying Nern. This makes no sense because it was decided at the convention that Lorcan's heart would be removed and destroyed. The convention which took place on Nern. Nern had to have been created before the convention, which means Nern had to have existed before Lorcan's heart was removed. But if his body became Nern before the heart was removed, wouldn't the heart have already been physically a part of Nern and therefore impossible to remove from a body that no longer exists? I'm confused. The reason this is impossible to make logical sense out of is that this was all put together using multiple sources, none of which tells the whole story in detail. How exactly Nern was created, what happened to Lorcan's body, when was his heart removed, and the events leading up to it being removed are the most conflicted details of this whole story. There's even a theory that Lorcan's body was ripped in half and created Nern's moons, Masser and Secunda. If that's the case, then there's no way Lorcan's body created Nern. But if his body wasn't a part of Nern, then why couldn't his heart be destroyed? Maybe Lorcan's heart was just so incredibly powerful that destroying it would cause a chain reaction that would unravel the very fabric of the space-time continuum and destroy the entire universe! Granted, that's a worst-case scenario. The destruction might in fact have been very localized, limited to merely the plane of Mundus. One other possible explanation is that at this point, time wasn't linear yet. So events could have occurred in a scheme of time that we as mere mortals are incapable of understanding. Sorting out and making sense of the details here is an impossible task, so we'll just leave it at that. Here's what matters. Lorcan either died in the creation of Nern or was killed by the other remaining gods. Then his heart was removed and it was intended that the heart be destroyed, but it wasn't because Nern would have been destroyed as well for some reason. Instead of destroying it, Auriel fired the heart from his bow into the sea, where it wouldn't be discovered. The heart was so powerful that Red Mountain formed around it, whose lava flows created the island of Varden Fell. After the convention concluded and Lorcan was dealt with, some of the gods were able to leave Nern and maintain some of their power, but not enough to return to Aetherius, and so were permanently confined to Mundus. This group of gods would eventually be known as the Eight Divines. Oriel slash Akatosh, Arke, Debella, Julianos, Kinnereth, Mara, Stendar, and Zenithar. Talos hasn't come into play yet and won't for a very long time. 
The eight created their own realms within Mundus, which can be seen from Nern as planets. One final group of gods were either unable to leave Nern or decided to stay and continue their work, even after learning of the consequences. They were left with none of their divine power and became the Elnofe, who in order to continue their existence resorted to procreation and would be the origins of the species of men and mare on Nern. There you have it. That is how Nern, Mundus, and the universe came into being according to a variety of sources that contradict each other at almost every turn. To me what this amounts to is that nobody really knows how everything started. Everybody has the same vague ideas and the overall story is pretty much the same across cultures. The devil's in the details though and that's where every culture's story of creation becomes unique. It was in the investigation of all of the most prevailing ideas that made it possible to gain a rough understanding of how things may have occurred in the beginning. And even then, we're still left with unanswered questions. Am I still talking about the Elder Scrolls? I've got to do something simpler next time. Until then, thanks for watching. <laughs>